Well, welcome everybody to week three of Unshakable. And, and please, if, if I, during prayer time, acknowledge that someone is here, don't, don't take it personally if I don't mention your name, uh, because I don't always see everybody that's here on Sunday morning until later in a service. And uh, even though they haven't been able to be with us for some time, it's so good to have Tim and Barbara Parrott back after the, the COVID struggle that they went through. Dottie Peppel, it's beautiful to see her back this morning. Uh, I know Doug's been out uh, hunting in South Dakota. It's great to have him back this morning too. Uh, I am blessed anytime that uh, we get to be together. And I wanna give a quick shout out to those of you that gather for Sunday school as well. Uh, let me just say we slay the monster of apathy and disinterest when we make the time and we take the time to gather to fellowship in God's Word. And I would encourage you that if you are not involved in a Sunday school class, uh, let me just say you are missing out. If you leisurely take your time to get ready for church on Sunday morning, you need to know that there are spouses like Michelle Riley that get up and fix her husband, Uncle Herschel's breakfast with bacon and eggs and sausage and biscuits and gravy, and they are still here. For Sunday school. So it is possible to have that done. Uh, maybe you just need to settle for a bowl of Cheerios, uh, but come and dine on God's Word, 915 uh, every Lord's Day. Uh, bring your family, bring grandparents, make, make a family habit of it. And before we roll the calendar over to November tomorrow and, and change our clocks next weekend, and please don't forget to change your clocks before next weekend, does anybody know what October the 3rd marked for this congregation. Anybody? It was our 26th anniversary. 26 years of shining the light of Christ in the world. And can I get an amen that this church is for everybody and anybody that wants to have their life changed by the love of Jesus Christ. For the last few weeks we've been in one book of the Bible called 1 Peter. And if you've got your Bible or if you use a Bible app and you want to get a head start, I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Peter 1. That's, that's where we're going to be and where we've been hanging out. We've come to know that this is a letter written by the apostle named Peter to a group of young Christians. And I'm not talking about people that are young in age. They're young in the faith. Most of these people, they did not grow up going to church. In fact, for many of them, they didn't grow up believing in God at all necessarily. But when they met Jesus... Their lives were transformed, and now they're trying to navigate their life, their following of Jesus in a world that's not. They're trying to move from their old way of life into this new way of life, even though it doesn't feel like any of their family is, or any of their family or coworkers or classmates are even heading in the same direction. And maybe that sounds incredibly familiar to some of you this morning because that describes your life. You're just doing everything you can to follow God in a world that isn't. And in week number one, we talked about how we have this unshakable hope. And the hope that we have as believers is a hope beyond all the circumstances, isn't it, of this life. It is strong enough to withstand the strongest of waves in this world. Last week, week number two, we talked about an undeserved grace. And we, we ended early, but it says this in 1 Peter 1, uh, beginning in verse 10. I want you to look at this with me. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, they searched intently and with the greatest of care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. And I love this part of the passage. It was revealed to them they were not serving themselves. They were serving you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. I think every time someone comes to belief in Jesus Christ, the angels are looking over the rim of heaven and they're saying, can you believe this? This is what this was all about. This is why he went. This is why he gave his life for this moment. As a person comes out of the waters of baptism and a new creation is born, the celebration begins. And the good news, friends, about being a follower of Jesus Christ is that the most important thing about me is what Jesus has already done 
for me. The most important thing about you is what Jesus has done for you. It doesn't have to do with my performance or my ability to get my act together. It's about what Jesus has done on our behalf. So here's kind of the way it works. And this is in your bulletin this morning. An unshakable hope is rooted in undeserved grace. And that creates uncommon lives. If our hope is truly fully in the fact that Jesus has come, that he has paid the penalty price for our sins, that he has given us a new life, friend, that is different. And, and, and my guess is that most of your friends, most of the people you meet every day, they're not living that kind of life. Most of your coworkers aren't living that kind of life. And so it's going to result in some uncommon lives. And maybe you spend most of your days experiencing, I don't fit in. <laughs> in fact, I feel a little odd. I feel a little different in circles now. And the truth is this. Sometimes as followers of Jesus, you will feel out of place. You ever been in one of those awkward uh, social interactions where you realize you're around a bunch of people that are just completely different than you? I remember once I was invited to a two and a half day small group ministers retreat. It was just me and seven other guys with one of my mentors, one of my favorite preachers of all time, Bob Russell. And Bob had preached down at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. God had worked through him to take a church of 120 people to a church of 18,000 people and three services every Lord's Day. And, and I was still driving at that time. It was a beautiful drive from, from Indiana over to uh, Henryville, Kentucky, or uh, Indiana, to, to this beautiful retreat called the Country Lake Christian Retreat, just 30 minutes uh, north of Louisville. And I drove into this gated resort area, and the first thing they did is, Mr. Warax, here's your gift bag. And it was full of books and, and little knickknacks and goodies. And, and they gave me a knit shirt with my name embroidered into it. And I thought, man, this is nice. I, this is, and they gave me my itinerary, and I checked in. I called Cheryl, and I went to the meeting room, and there sitting at the table w w was this man that I had admired for so long, Bob Russell. And he was sitting there with one of my former classmates, literally, at the Cincinnati Bible College, Dave Stone. And by Dave sat Jack Coffey. He was a retired UPS executive for 25 years. He had led the church through three major building programs. Next to him was entrepreneur Matt Chalfin. He was a former executive officer at Merrill Lynch. He's now CFO, uh, CFO of UBS Wealth Management. And next to him was John Foster. Love John Foster. Lead sales manager at Procter & Gamble for 34 years. And I thought, man, these guys are, are up here, and, and I'm just out of my league. And, and the next day, Bob took us to visit a, a private VIP tour of the Louisville Slugger factory. And John Hillerich, the, the owner, the, the, the CEO, was there, and he took us on this private tour. And he said, guys, I want you to take this. And he handed over this bat. He said, this was the bat that Hank Aaron hit his 700th home run with. And I got to, I got to hold on to that. And they gave us a bat that John Hillard signed, had our name engraved like professional baseball players on the end of it. And then we changed for dinner. Let me tell you, we changed for dinner and we went to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Some of you have been there, right? It was on the 16th floor of the Caden Towers in Louisville. I got to tell you, uh, Caesar salad, barbecued shrimp as an appetizer, and then filet mignon. Ap uh, asparagus, baked potato, creme brulee for dessert. It was $118 a person. And then on the last night, we were invited to a private dinner at Bob and Judy Russell's house. And I sat there in, in this man of God's house, pampered as we were. That one thought kept th coming through, I am out of my league I am so far out of my league. And maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been at a place, and often the life of a follower of Jesus, it can feel awkward. You're looking at the people around you, uh, the people that you go to school with, people that you hang out with in your neighborhood, and you start to think to yourself, I don't fit in. It, it's like they've got all these inside jokes and inside stories, and, and I'm not part of it. They're using a different language that I don't use. 
Um, they're, they're aiming at targets in life that aren't even on, you know, my scope. And sometimes it just feels that we're out of place. And in 1 Peter, he's going to give us some words and terms that help us confirm and affirm that suspicion. He's going to say that if you follow Jesus, you're going to feel different. He says it, it, it's actually a good thing. You want to be like Joshua's buddy Caleb in the Old Testament. When God said about him in Numbers 14, 24, my servant Caleb has a different attitude than others have. He's remained loyal to me, so I'll bring him into the land that he explored. His descendants will possess a full share of that land. Your attitude is different. And God says, that's good. You stick with me, and I'll bring you into the possession of faith that I have for you. I'll bring you blessing. He said through Paul, in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. Be different, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And then God gives us the best of tools to operate in this Christian life that we have claimed in a world that isn't Christian. And we try our hardest. And I want to pick this up in 1 Peter 1, verse 13. It's a little bit different version. I think I've given you the New Living Translation to read, but I want you to, I'm reading from the NIV. It says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope fully on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy. Because I am holy. You see, Peter is writing these to these young Christians 2,000 years ago, and he's saying the very same thing to you and me today. He's saying part of following Jesus is that you are called to be holy. And that word means different. It means distinct. It means set apart. So the sneaking suspicion you have that you're not like everybody else you're right. You see, Peter wants us to recognize that we're not called to diversify. You see, we're called to put all our hope in God's grace. Now, diversifying is a, is a term that you should understand in this world. In this world, we're told to diversify when it comes to our portfolios, right? You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to have investments in different sectors and industries. You want to allocate different stocks and, and, and bonds, money markets, IRAs, hedge funds, real estate. You know, you want to invest in real estate? I'll, I'll introduce you to my buddy Doug Cox back here. Uh, you have Lionel Trains? Hang on to them. They're an investment long term. And how many of you remember Legos growing up? Love Legos. My little buddy Landon Lally. He's got all kinds of Legos. Did you know that over the long term, Legos have outproven the stock market if you hold on to them? They're actually a financial investment. And then you diversify by gathering to yourself international commodities like silver and gold. And in verse 13, Peter says, if you feel out of place, it's because you've been called to not diversify. You've been called to place all of your hope in Jesus Christ, in his gracious salvation. In fact, the only thing that you can hold out hope for is God's grace. We sing the song, sin and despair like the sea waves cold, threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. God doesn't call us to diversify, put a little bit of your faith, a little bit of your trust here, a little bit of your faith here. All of your hope, friends, has to rest on the grace of God. You ever been to a backyard barbecue and, and come upon one of these? Remember these lawn chairs? Yeah, uh, all the other good chairs are taken, and you see this one chair, and, and you've got to make a calculated decision, right? 
It's got a little bit of a rusted frame to it. The aluminum's kind of bent, maybe. Uh, the webbing on the chair is starting to be frayed and give way. And you've got to decide, can this thing really hold my weight? Because I don't want to be the next meme circulating on the Internet, okay? I, I don't want to be on, on YouTube at some point. Is this worth the risk? Can it hold my weight? And what Peter's trying to illustrate is that most people, they're, they're, they're holding out hope in these aluminum lawn chairs to hold their hope. To hold our hope for the future. To hold their hope for relationships. To, to hold a hope for reconciliation. He's saying we're trusting things that can never hold the weight of real hope. Another way of understanding where you put your hope is to simply consider how would you answer this question? How do I know that I'm okay? How do I know that I'm okay? And that's an easy question to answer, I think. When the ground seems to be moving underneath me, when the gravel and the talus of the slope starts to shift, when you're shuffling across the ice and it starts to get a, a little slippery, what's the most natural thing that you're going to do? You're going to reach out and you're going to grab onto something to steady yourself. So when life moves underneath your feet, what do you grab for? What do you grab to hold your equilibrium, to hold you upright, to let you know you're okay? For some of you, it's logging on because you want to see the account balance. For some of you, it's reaching out for that partner, that, that person that you cherish in your life. And as long as they're there and you're good, then I'm good. Sometimes we reach out for our kids and we say, you know, I, I don't care if I'm okay. As long as my kids are okay, as long as they're happy, as long as they're healthy, as long as they're successful, academically, athletically, as long as they're okay, I'm okay. Sometimes we actually think like the, the psalmist Asaph when he says this in Psalm 73. He says, I, I look around and I envy the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They get everything they want, he said. Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning, he said, it brings me nothing but pain. And maybe you feel that way. And Peter's saying, you need to go back and ask yourself, how do you know you're okay? Because there's a lot of weak lawn chairs that can't hold the weight of your hope. Your account numbers, no matter how big those numbers grow, they cannot make you feel at peace. Your partner was never made to hold the weight of your life. The little shoulders of your children, of your grandchildren, you can never live enough vicariously through them to have a true hope. And if if you can put all your hope in the grace of God, friends, then your life will be uncommon. Because as we've already said, there, there are far too few people that are doing that. For so many around us, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, and even in our families, their hope is in their career, in some future advancement, in some future promotion, some future result, a relationship, hobby. And yet if we can put our hope fully in Jesus Christ, our lives will be different. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, there's some terms that Peter gives us to experience uh, in, in, in our life when he says this. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and as foreigners... Catch that, to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors, and then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your honorable behavior, and they'll give honor to God when, when he judges the world. Peter says, you know that seeking suspicion that you don't fit in? <laughs> You're right. You are a temporary tenant. You are a foreigner, a resident. And the very second you start following Jesus, friends, don't you recognize this world is no longer your home? This world is no longer the place where we put all of our hopes and we're going to feel different. Now, most of you, as I've come to know you, are from Springfield. 
Some of you, you'll understand like me, the experience of being born somewhere else, but living most of your life in a different place. You know that I was born in Lexington in the state of Kentucky. There, I was there for the first 18 years of my life. But then I lived for a time in Deerfield, Illinois, in North Chicago. I lived in Curtisville and in Huntington, Indiana. Skipped over Erlinger a little bit. I've lived here for 12 years in Springfield, Ohio. And for the most of you, you know that I've lived most of my life somewhere other than where I was born. And I'm just curious. I want to ask you for a show of hands. How many of you were not born in Springfield, Ohio? Raise your hand for me if you would. Yeah, just very, very few of you here today. The, the interesting thing is, if, you, if you're born somewhere else and you, than where you live, you're going to notice two huge differences. Number one, you're going to notice all the differences. You operate in a world that is unfamiliar to you. For instance, until I moved to Ohio, I never knew that these were an iconic candy for Ohio. Okay? I never knew about this. Skyline Chili, never heard of a three-way, four-way, five-way. I never heard of Skyliners until I moved here. In fact, for, for people in Kentucky, this is not chili, okay? It's great chili now that I've been here, but I didn't know what this was. Never heard of it. I love colleges, and I love colleges town and I, 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 college towns. I watch the SEC tournament on ESPN, and I, I watch UK play. I have never been to a state that refers to their university as the Ohio State University. In fact, all I have to do is use the article, the, and anybody knows. Oh, you're talking about Ohio State, aren't you? Yep, yep, nobody else does that. Where I come from, this is a horseshoe. After I moved here, this was a shoe, okay? There are huge differences here. And sometimes it's the office you're in. Sometimes it's the coworkers you have. They're doing things different. Maybe your coworkers are cutting corners. Maybe they're jockeying uh, for, for promotion. Maybe they're backstabbing their fellow teammates. And, and you hear them talking sometimes. Maybe it's your neighbors even. You hear them talking about their spouses. And, and every time they do... They gripe and they complain. You think, man, I, I would not want a marriage like that. I want to be different. And Peter's saying, good. All of that is good. It's a healthy lens through which to see the world. Not so that you get some air of spirituality that you are more holier than thou or better than other people. It just means that you're sensitive enough to notice the difference. And be glad that God has called you as, as a foreigner. Be glad that he has called you into something else. You're growing up in a place that's not really your home. Well, another thing you'll notice is that terms change. You'll, you'll notice that you represent your home. You all know in my life, yeah, I can say everybody here knows at least one person from Kentucky because you know me. Now, I know Elvin and Lily are from Kentucky as well, and, and so you know them, but at least you know one person. And since I started here 12 years ago, I am the de facto representation of my home state. Even when Cheryl and I went out to visit Emma and Derek in Denver, Colorado, and I've got my Kentucky sweatshirt on, people will assume that everybody in Kentucky is just like me. And they will ask me questions. I know you do too because you ask the same questions. You're from Kentucky. Did you grow up riding horses? It's the thoroughbred state. No, I did not. I got bit by a horse once, but I did not grow up riding horses. You don't have an accent. Don't people in Kentucky sound like sweet tea and burgoo and y'all and yonder and bless your little heart. You know, I, after 36 years, I guess I've, I've just lost that accent unless I'm tired. Or I preach too long and then it comes out. <laughs> oh, you're from Kentucky and you're wearing shoes. I'm so impressed, they'll say. Are those your teeth or somebody else's? They'll say, oh, you're from Kentucky. Does that mean Cheryl is your cousin? No. We don't marry our cousins. What's, what's wrong with you? It happens. And being a Christian is just a healthy reminder when people look at me, I represent my home. And Peter says, I need to remember, and you need to remember as we operate in this life, that the world isn't just watching how you respond to situations because you're showing them a follower of Jesus and how they respond to situations. You see, you represent your home. 
you represent your king. Everything you say, everything you do, Christians, everything that you post online, everything you tweet or respond to is a representation of Jesus. We represent our home. We represent our king. Paul would say this way in Colossians 3.23, work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. You're a reflection of him. When you're in the office and a stressful situation arises, your coworkers aren't just watching to see how you respond to a stressful situation. They're watching to see how does a follower of Jesus respond to a stressful situation. If you are publicly declaring you are a follower of Jesus, you represent the king wherever you go. And it doesn't mean, I I don't say that to put undue pressure on you, But it's a reminder that to a watching world, you're a living example of what it's like to put the full weight of your hope on Jesus. And I think that what he says in closing is one of the greatest opportunities we have as believers in 2021. Now, I know the Bible gets a bad rap for for being old, for being written halfway around the world in in a totally different time. People will say the Bible is irrelevant to what we're experiencing in life today. But let me just say this, Peter steps in to one of the most sensitive and impactful opportunities you and I have to model what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ today. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, with what he said there, down to verse 17. In verse 17 he says, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know it was not with perishable things as silver and gold you redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He wants you to know faith matters. In chapter 2, verse 13, he says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every, every human authority whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. It's God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Now, Now mark this down, verse 17. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God, honor the emperor. Now it would be easy to say, Peter wrote that 2,000 years ago. If he knew our leaders, <laughs> if he stepped in to the halls of Washington, D.C., he would never have written that. If he saw the garbage coming out of our leaders, there's no way he would have said that. I want you to look at this image this morning. This is a forensic reconstruction of, of, of who was emperor in Rome when Peter wrote this letter. He wrote it in 62, 63 AD. The leader of Rome was a man named Nero. And Nero was an all-time bad guy. He was put on the throne as a teenager by his mother who used the marriage and murder to put him on the throne so that she could manipulate him and rule vicariously through him. As he aged and grew up, he wanted to spread his own wings as a leader. And the only way he thought he could do that was by having his own mother killed. He killed his second wife by kicking her to death when she was pregnant. Later on, he would force a man to marry him. And in the ceremony, Nero dressed up as the woman. A couple of years later, when fire broke out and decimated huge swaths of the city of Rome, he needed a political scapegoat. And and so who did he choose? He chose the Christians. He called them haters of humanity and mass persecution broke out against Christians. The Roman historian Tacitus, not a believer in Christ, a Roman historian documented it this way, and I quote, In their very deaths they were made the subjects of sport, for they were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs. They were nailed or lashed to crosses or set fire to, and when the day waned, they were burned to serve as the illuminating evening lights, victims of the ferocity of one man. Friends, that is who was in charge when Peter wrote, Worship God, honor the emperor. 
It is only when you place the full weight of your hope on the grace of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that that even becomes possible. Now, the caveat I would tell you this morning is this. Honor does not equal worship. Peter did not say to worship or to put your hope in the people in charge. And I don't know about you, I am sick of seeing Christian symbols and scripture verses attached to political activism and actions. Our world will pull a scripture out of context to justify what they want to do. And people will say, I hope the world gets better. I hope the right person comes along to do it. I hope the person that I've chosen is the one to get it done. The problem is, friends, they're just people. J.C. Ryle said it very well. He said, the very best of men are only men at their very best. Nobody in this world was meant to carry the weight of your hope. Their shoulders are not broad enough. They are imperfect sinners in need of grace, just like you and me. And the second thing is honor never means blind allegiance. We need Christians who understand what it means to be holy. That there is a time for believers in Christ to draw the line. It's how in the Old Testament Daniel ended up in a lion's den. He refused to pray to a king and he said, none but God. It's why his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be thrown into a white hot furnace. And they would say just before in Daniel 3, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the image of gold that you have set up. The prophet Nathan could walk right into the, the, the palace of the king, of King David, and confront him about his murder and his plotting and his extramarital affair. The author of this letter himself would stand before the religious authorities who would command him, you stop speaking of Jesus, you stop impressing your morals, which were God's morals upon people. And he would say in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. How we need people that will draw the line and say, for me, no compromise. It's all about Jesus. David Jeremiah wrote the quote I've got there in your bulletin. This is a time when all of God's people need to keep their eyes and their Bibles wide open. Amen to that. We must ask God for discernment as never before. And friends, above it all, we've got the beautiful, the wonderful, the glorious example of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.20, and I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation here. It says very simply, of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're being beaten for doing wrong. But if If you suffer for doing good and you endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as, what? Christ suffered for you. He's your example and you must follow in his step. There is no other way, he said. He never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he, was, when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. I love that. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross, so we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. For by his wounds you're healed. Once you were like sheep, there you go. You heard that in communion time today. It's why we need sheep dip in communion. It's why we need protection from parasites. It's why we need one who loves us enough to guide us as a great shepherd. You wandered away, but now you've returned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. You see, friends, the only one that can hold the weight of the hope that you have is Jesus. And we may live in uncommon times, And we might have uncommon lives with the peace that comes from him. We cling to him in a time of fear and anxiety. And for God's sake, we do it so that a watching world can find life and grace and love in Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you, SCC. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. And let me pray for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that what happens 
here in this place, what happens among the hearts of your sons and daughters is uncommon. In fact, it, it is so uncommon that we would be called a peculiar people. Father, I ask you help us to be distinctive for you. To recognize that what we have here is, is something that should never be taken for granted. This is, is the representation of fellowship, your kingdom here on this earth, the church. It could all be gone tomorrow. Either one, because of persecution and we're scattered, or two, because you come to call us home. And Father, whether we bleed in this life or whether we're called to your side, we want our banner to be clear. Whether it's making sure we've chosen you as our Lord and Savior and surrendered, we have that joy and that opportunity every Lord's day, every moment of breath to surrender to you. And Father, in a world that just goes with the flow, in a world that will take your love out of context and say, it's about my liberty, my freedom, and not responsibility. You're the one that reminds us. We represent our homeland. We represent our King. Help us to do it now in the decisions we make in Jesus' name.